Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. Our uh, listener support period continues. I want to thank Lisa for donating to us by mail. Um, you can also... Uh, Support us on a one-time basis, support.greatdetectives.net, and become an ongoing supporter at patreon.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time for today's episode of Inspector Thorne. The original air date is uh, August the 17th, 1951, and this one is The Hostile Murder Case. And now the National Broadcasting Company presents Inspector Thorne in... The High Style Murder Case. Tonight, the National Broadcasting Company presents the exploits of the spectacular young Inspector Thorne of the Homicide Bureau, whose investigations rank with many of the most celebrated ones in the annals of crime fiction. An investigator smart enough to claim he is dumb and modest enough to believe it. Tonight, Inspector Thorne turns to the high-style murder case. It is late one afternoon in the private office of Madame Florette, head of Florette Incorporated, one of the most famous dress houses in the fashion world. Madame Florette, distinguished by a reputation for fanatical honesty, is young and beautiful despite her fantastic success. But she seems disturbed as she turns to her secretary and speaks the words that lead to terror and murder. Lucille, I'm ready to see Stephen Marsh now. He will be happy, Madame Florette. Monsieur Stephen has been waiting for an hour. Madame Florette will see you, Monsieur Stephen. Uh, thank you, Lucille. Wait outside, Lucille. Oui, Madame. Stephen, I'm not going to beat around the bush. What is it, Madame Florette? Uh, Hasn't my work been satisfactory? Don't put on such an innocent air. You've been padding accounts, Stephen, stealing from the firm. No, no. Don't squirm and lie, you thief. I have the proof right here. I hired you in the first place only for the sake of your mother. But, Madame But I don't care how long your mother's been working for me. You're a thief and I'm going to turn you over to the police. No. No, you, you can't do that. I... I made a mistake. I I lost some money in a deal, and I had to pay it back. I I got in deeper and deeper, but if you'll only give me another chance... There's no excuse for dishonesty, Stephen. Well, then please give me some time, Madame Florette. I'll pay you back, but don't wreck my whole life and... and think of Mother. It will break her heart. Very well, Stephen. I'll give you until tomorrow morning to pay back all the money you stole. Tomorrow morning? But, Madame Florette, I can't raise the money by then. If you don't, Stephen, I shall turn you over to the police. Now, leave my office before I call my manager, George Harmon, and have you thrown out. Oh, it makes me ill to look at a thief. And now, the next morning, we see Madame Florette's secretary, Lucille Valois, coming to work passing through the outer rooms and entering Madame Florette's private office. Good morning, Madame Florette. I have... (gasps) Ah! Madame Florette! Help! Murder! What is it? What's the matter? Monsieur Harmon, someone has killed Madame Florette. She's dead. Stabbed in the back with a scissors. What? Get the police. Oh, get the police. Why don't the police get here? It's only been ten minutes since we called them, Lucille. Oh, Monsieur Harmon, I shall never forget the terrible sight. My poor Madame Fleurette, lying in a pool of blood. Oh, stow it, Lucille. You didn't give a hoot for Madame Fleurette. Listen to the big, important general manager talking. You better be careful, George Harmon. And you better quit putting on that act when Inspector Thorne gets here. Thorne's hot stuff and he'll see through you like a pane of glass. I'm not afraid of Inspector Thorne. Maybe you are, George. Me? Why should I be afraid? Keep quiet, Lucille. Someone's coming. 
Inspector Thorne? Yes, I'm Thorne. This is my associate, Sergeant Muggin. Morning. Inspector Thorne, I'm George Harmon, Madame Fleurette's general manager. How do you do, Mr. Harmon? Is this the lady who found the body? Yes, yes, I am the one. What is your name? Uh, her name is Lucille Valois. She... Mr. Harmon, let Miss Valois speak for herself. Go on, Miss Valois. Yes, Inspector Thorne. I was poor Madame's secretary. I entered her office this morning thinking to find her working, as always, when I see her lying by the side of her desk, stabbed with a big pair of dressmaker scissors. I see. Oh, it was horrible, Inspector Thorne. I, I scream and run out right into the arms of Monsieur Harmon here. I'm so grateful Monsieur Harmon is here early in the morning. Earlier than usual. Hey, what are you saying, Lucille? She said you were here earlier than usual, Harmon. Is that true? No, no, Inspector Thorne. That is, I sometimes come in this early. But not often. Whenever I have special work to do. And just what is your work here, Mr. Harmon? Well, as I told you, Inspector Thorne, I am Madame Fleurette's general manager. I select all the materials we make our dresses from. This morning I had to arrange a dinner for some buyers. Ha! A matter of an hour. What are you trying to do, Lucille? Get even by making me look suspicious? Get even for what, Harmon? Ah, oh, I, I spoke out of turn, Inspector Thorne. It's your turn now. Go on. <laughs> You shouldn't take Lucille seriously, Inspector Thorne. Don't you insult me, George Harmon. Half the time you don't know what you're saying, Lucille. You get so worked up. Oh, really? She's as temperamental as a tiger, Inspector Thorne. And right now she's sore at me because I told her she was dramatizing herself. I'm no genius, Harmon, but I've had plenty of experience telling facts from fancies. Is, uh, is that Madame Florette's office? Yes, Inspector Thorne. Let's have a look, Sergeant Muggan. Okay, Chief. Well, there's the body. Hmm. Nasty sight, Muggin. Yeah, pair of scissors in her back. The scissors must have gone straight to Madame Florette's heart. Lucky for her. I've seen him where the murderer had to stab her half a dozen times. Save it for your memoirs, Muggin. Hmm. Desk light on. She must have been working late. Have a look at this paper on her desk, Muggin. Oh. It's a notice of a shipment of dresses from Paris clearing through customs today. Yes. Apparently she was killed in the middle of a job, working till the last. Died with her boots on, huh? I'm not so sure of that. What do you mean, Chief? Take a look at her shoes, Sergeant Muggan. So? I'm no expert on women's clothes, Muggan, but I've noticed most of them won't go out of the house in certain color combinations. Yeah? Then... How come a fashion expert like Madame Florette is wearing black shoes with a navy blue dress? Even the average well-dressed woman wouldn't wear that color combination. Hey, Chief. That's right. Who's that? It's me, Lucille Valois. I have something to tell you, Inspector Thorne. All right, Miss Valois. I'm through here anyway. Sergeant Muggan, while I talk to the secretary, Lucille Valois, you check the building employees. Find out if anyone came in here late last night. Got you, Chief. Now, Miss Valois, what is it? If, uh, if there is a murder, the police, they look for people with a motive, no? Yes. Then, uh, then it is my duty to tell you that yesterday, Madame Florette sent for a young man who works here, Stephen Marsh. Stephen Marsh? Yes, Inspector Thorne. I overhear their conversation. Madame has found out that Stephen Marsh was padding accounts, stealing. Stealing? Yes. You see, Madame is a holy terror about honesty. She was furious with Stephen. I shouldn't wonder, Lucille. She said she was going to turn him over to the police. He pleaded with her, and finally she gave him till this morning to return the money. You certainly got an earful, Miss Valois. I did not listen on purpose. They were talking so loud I could not help hearing. I have a few questions for you, Miss Valois. You're French. But of course. I suppose Madame Florette hired you so she could speak her own language with someone? Not at all, Inspector Thorne. Madame Florette was no more French than you are. Is that right, Lucille? You see, a French name is supposed to be good in the fashion business. Yes, so I've heard. How long did you work for Madame Florette? It is uh, two years now. Oh, that it should end like this. You will arrest Stephen Marsh? We have to find him first. Oh, Inspector Thorne, there's Stephen's mother, Mrs. Marsh, just coming in. Maybe she knows where he is. Stephen's mother? But yes, she works here as a fitter. 
Oh, Mrs. Marsh. Good morning, Lucille. I'm sorry I'm so late. I, I had a terrible night. I want to see Madame Florette. Please tell her I must see her right away. Madame Florette? But don't Miss you Valois, know... Miss Valois, will you step outside, please? Certainly, Inspector Thorne, if you wish. Now, Mrs. Marsh, why did you want to see Madame Florette? It's a personal matter, sir. Is it about your son, Stephen? Who are you? I'm Inspector Thorne of the police. <gasps> the police? I suspect you want to see Madame Florette to plead for your son, whom she caught stealing. You know about Stephen? Yes, Mrs. Marsh. But Madame Florette promised not to tell the police till this afternoon. So I've heard. Inspector Thorne, please, please don't arrest my son, Stephen. He'll return the money. Stephen's a good boy. I'm not interested in arresting Stephen for padding accounts, Mrs. Marsh. It's a matter of murder. Murder? Madame Florette has been stabbed in the back with a pair of scissors. Oh, no. And I'm sorry to say your son Stephen's in it up to his neck. No, not Stephen. Where is your son? Where? I don't know, Inspector Thorne. When did you see him last? I saw Stephen last night. He, he came home after work, told me what happened, said he had seen Madame Florette, and that she had given him until this morning to pay back the money he'd stolen. And then? Then he, he went out. Where did he go? I don't know, to try to raise the money somewhere. Stephen wouldn't kill anybody, Inspector Thorne. Maybe he's weak, but he wouldn't kill anybody. Still, he didn't come home all night? I'm sure Stephen can explain. I'm sure he can tell you exactly where he went. I suggest you try to find him, Mrs. Marsh. I will. I, I will. Inspector Thorne. What's up, Sergeant Muggan? I've got something in the next room you ought to see. All right, Muggan. If you locate your son, Mrs. Marsh, you'd better tell him to give himself up. Where can Stephen be? I've got to find him. Why didn't he come home? I've got to think. Where can Stephen be? The phone. I'm not going to answer. I've got enough on my mind. Oh, Mrs. Marsh, that phone calls for you. Will you take it in there? Uh, for me? Yes. Uh, all right, I'll take it, Lucille. Bien, Mrs. Marsh, I leave you. Who could be phoning me? Hello? Hello? Mother? Stephen, where are you? I'm home, Mother. I I just wanted to tell you goodbye. Goodbye? Stephen! I can't face it, Mother. I'm going to end it all, and I, I just wanted you to know that I thank you and love you. No, no, Stephen, wait for me. I'm coming right home. We'll talk it over then. It's no use, Mother. Goodbye. Stephen! Stephen! I've got to stop him. I've got to do something. Inspector Thorne, hurry, help me. Mrs. Marsh, what is it? It's my son, Stephen. He's going to kill himself. You've got to save him, Inspector Thorne. Where is he? At home, 2 West 9th Street. Let's go, Sergeant Muggan. Here's the Marsh apartment, Sergeant Muggan. The door's not locked, Chief. No one in this room. I smell gas. Quick, Muggan, the kitchen. Open the kitchen door. The place is filled with gas. Open the window. Yeah. There's Stephen Marsh, lying by the stove with the gas jets open. I'll turn off those jets, Chief. Oh. <coughs> well, Stephen isn't even unconscious yet. Go away. Let me die. Come on, Stephen. Sit up. Who are you? I'm Inspector Thorne. This is Sergeant Muggan. Why didn't you let me die? I don't think you really wanted to die, Stephen. What? I may be dumb, but I think if you really wanted to commit suicide, you wouldn't have telephoned your mother and then taken such a slow way out. I did want to die. I did. Then what's this monkey wrench doing at your side? Isn't it there to break a window in case we didn't arrive to rescue you and you felt yourself passing out? Isn't it? I, I was crazy. I, I, I thought I'd get some sympathy. By staging a fake suicide? Pretty tough on your mother, wasn't it? I couldn't face being jailed for a thief. For a thief or a murderer? A murderer? Yeah. Madame Florette was bumped off last night. What, Sergeant Muck? Well, I didn't kill her. I wasn't near the place. No, Stephen. Here's a page from the night book of the office building. Everyone who enters or leaves after five is supposed to sign in. Well, what of it, Inspector Thorne? You signed this book 
when you entered that building at 9 p.m., Stephen. When you came out, you tried to erase your name and sign a phony name over it. But the erasure is obvious. I'll tell you the truth, Inspector Thorne. That's a no idea. Let him talk, Sergeant Muggin. I, I did steal some money from the firm, Inspector Thorne. Madame Florette threatened to turn me over to the police unless I paid it back by the date. Go on, Stephen. Uh, I tried to raise the money, but couldn't. So I, I went back to the office last night to plead with Madame Florette for more time. When I got there, she was already dead. Do you expect me to believe that? It's the truth. Listen, I wasn't the only one who had something against Madame Florette. No? Oh, why don't you get after her secretary, Lucille Valois? Why? Because Lucille is nuts for the general manager, George Harmon, that's why. And Madame Florette stole Harmon away from her. Holy cats. As you say, Muggin. Well, on your feet, Stephen. We're going back to Florette Incorporated to find out which one of you is lying. Inspector Thorne in the high-style murder case will return in just a moment. But first, it's the Silver Jubilee on NBC. Tonight, be sure to hear Mr. Keene, tracer of lost persons, as he brings you the story of the poisoned sandwich murder case. And here are a few reminders about Sunday evening's radio features. First, there's Tom Conway as gentleman detective Simon Templer, alias The Saint. Then screen actor Lloyd Nolan brings you another hard-hitting story as Martin Kane, Private Eye. And actor Carlton Young comes to the NBC microphone in the double role of Philip Galt and The Whisperer. Then, later Sunday evening, join Mr. Moto on another adventure in the realm of international intrigue. Then, on Thursday evening, we present a new idea in dramatic radio entertainment. We call this program Dimension X, and it features stories dealing in time and space, which ask the radio listener to use his imagination and envision himself in the world of tomorrow. Well, there you have it. A brief rundown of the programs you soon will hear. Programs designed for the best in summer radio entertainment and heard on this, your NBC station. Now, back to Inspector Thorne and the High Style Murder Case. Madame Florette, owner of Florette Incorporated, internationally famous dress house, has been found murdered, stabbed in the back with a pair of dressmaker scissors. Investigating the murder, Inspector Thorne finds that Madame Florette had threatened a young employee named Stephen Marsh with jail for stealing money from the firm. Inspector Thorne has questioned the murdered woman's French secretary, Lucille Valois, her general manager, George Harmon, and Stephen's mother, Mrs. Marsh, a fitter at Florette Incorporated. Suddenly, Stephen Marsh stages a fake suicide, and when faced with this, he accuses the secretary, Lucille Valois, of the murder, saying it was well known that Madame Florette had stolen the man Lucille loved, the manager, George Harmon. Now we see Inspector Thorne confronting the secretary and saying, Now, Miss Valois, I'm told you're in love with the general manager, George Harmon. In love with that pig? <laughs> Don't make such a joke. I expected you to lie to me. But it isn't a lie, Inspector Thorne. George Harmon is not my type of man, I assure you. Strange. It's common gossip around this dressmaking establishment that when you first came to work here, George Harmon gave you a big whirl and that you liked every minute of it. You're naive. I flirted with George for the sake of my job. You dated George Harmon four or five evenings a week. You're a busy man digging up dirt. Murder's a dirty business, Miss Valois. I had nothing to do with the murder. You were the first to find Madame Florette's body. So? And as far as we know, the last to see her alive. That doesn't mean a thing, Inspector Thorne, and you know it. But this does, Miss Valois. About a year ago, George Harmon stopped taking you out. He became very cozy with Madame Florette. I didn't care. I was tired of George. Is that why you tried to resign? What is that you say? Credit the police with some sense, Miss Valois. We've checked the office files and found your letter of resignation. You told Madame Florette you wanted to leave for personal reasons. My, uh, my mother was sick. Your mother has been dead 
for five years. All right. George threw me over for that woman, for Madame Fleurette. I could not bear to see her every day. Yet you changed your mind, stayed on the job. Well, I... I Did th- you figure you might win George Harmon back? No, no, I... And after a year of waiting in vain for George Harmon... Did you decide to clear the way by stabbing Madame Florette with a pair of scissors? You are cruel. You have made me tell my dearest secrets, and now that you could think I'd do something so horrible. I um, don't think you need that handkerchief, Miss Valois. When you cry, there should be tears. You beast. Excuse me, Inspector Thorne. Yes, Sergeant Muggin. A crate of dresses from Paris just arrived from customs. They're marked personal for Madame Florette. Yes, and I told you I'd take charge of those dresses, Sergeant Muggin. They're marked for Madame Florette, Mr. Harmon. That is right. Madame always wanted to open the new dresses herself, alone. It was a rule. Rules or no rules, Florette can't open them now, Lucille. With your permission, Inspector, I'll just take over and open the crate. Why so anxious, Harmon? I'm not anxious, Inspector Thorne. I merely want everyone to realize that I'm the boss now. Sergeant Muggin... Bring the crate of dresses in here. Okay, Chief. Oh, this is ridiculous. I've always been second in command here. Until the murder's solved, I'm the boss, Harmon. Here's the crate, Chief. Open it, Sergeant Muggin. You can pry it open. I'll just get a couple of these nails out. There she goes. Ah, I'll take off some of this paper. Oh, my old lady will get a kick out of this. Me, seeing Paris frocks hot off the boat. Oh, this is the most ridiculous performance. Is it, Harmon? What possible connection has that crate of dresses got to do with Madame Florette's murder? Answer this one, Harmon. Why did Madame Florette always open the shipments alone? Hmm, this green dress on top is nice. Nice? Oh, it is a dream. That's the word. Oh, I don't think so much at this number. Well, Inspector Thorne, now you're a fashion expert. Maybe I'm not, Harmon, but these big rosettes look hideous to me. And they... they feel heavy, too. Heavy? Much too heavy for a lady to wear in comfort. I'll just tear one off. Hey, you can't do that. You're ruining the dress. Just as I thought, Harmon. Hidden in this rosette... Our diamonds. What? Diamonds? These dresses contain a shipment of stolen jewels. Impossible. Madame was honest as a day. Madame was in the business of smuggling stolen jewels in the dresses she imported from Paris, Lucille. That's why she opened these crates alone. Chief, you mean all that blather about honesty was just a front? Exactly, Sergeant Muggin. Madame Florette was a clever crook who built up such a reputation for honesty that no one would suspect her of operating a racket on the side. I can't believe it. It's absolutely incredible. Then you never had a suspicion, Harmon. Not a glimmer. I'm wondering why you were so anxious to open this crate yourself. Well, if you're thinking I knew about this smuggling business... Didn't you? I'm a respectable American businessman. I was a success in the dress goods market before I ever came in with Florette. You can look up my record. Now I see, George. Now I see why you left me for Florette. Be quiet, Lucy. Oh, no. You can't tell me you didn't know what was going on. You and Madame Florette were as thick as thieves. You don't know anything about it, Lucille. I know all about it. I saw you with your heads together, whispering, Lucille, looking guilty. shut up, I said. You can't stop me from talking, George. Well, talk if you want, you fool. What you don't know is, Florette and I were secretly married. <gasps> married? That's why you saw us with our heads together, whispering, Lucille. That's why we were so thick. A secret marriage. Florette right? wanted it that way, Inspector Thorne. She said it would be bad for business. Now I see... She must have been afraid I'd find out about her stolen jewel racket if we lived together openly. Don't believe a word of it, Inspector. A husband knows his wife's business. You've tried to get revenge on me long enough, Lucille. Maybe you were in the diamond smuggling racket with Florette. Me? Those dresses came from Paris, and so did you. That's enough from both of you. Come on, Sergeant Muggin. We have work to do. Right you are, Chief. Well, what a case, Muggin. Yeah, Half of them are crooks, Chief. First the kid, Stephen Marsh, who stole money from the firm. Then Madame Florette, who's supposed to be so honest. Now maybe the manager, Harmon, and the secretary, Lucille. We'll find out about them, and fast. Cable the Paris police, Muggin. Find out who represented Madame Florette in Paris and shipped those dresses to her. Gotcha. When I know who was working with Madame Florette in the diamond smuggling racket, I'll be ready to move in on the killer. <laughs> And 
And so, sometime later in the office of the dressmaking house of Florette Incorporated, we hear Inspector Thorne say, Are they all here, Sergeant Muggan? The whole gang, Inspector Thorne. I'm and the manager and the secretary, Lucille, young Stephen Marsh and Stephen's mother. I'll go in and see them. Well, at last, Inspector, I'm beginning to wonder about American justice. You needn't wonder, Miss Valois, if you're innocent. Mr. Harmon. Yes, Inspector Thorne. I've been working with the Paris police. They've picked up the murdered Madame Florette's confederate in France. This confederate has confessed and implicated a gang of jewel thieves we've been after for a long time. And me? You are in the clear, Mr. Harmon. Inspector Thorne, I apologize. I should have had more faith in you. Do you mean George is innocent of the diamond smuggling? I do, Miss Valois. Now, uh, you, Mrs. Marsh, you worked here as a fitter. Did you ever fit Madame Florette's personal gowns? Always, Inspector Thorne. When did you do it? After hours? Yes, sir. And did you fit a new dress on Madame Florette the night of her murder? Why, no, I, I never went near her. Mrs. Marsh, you're lying. When I saw the body, Madame Florette was wearing black shoes with a navy blue dress. Madame would never wear such a combination. I thought not, Miss Valois. So the only explanation is that she was trying on that navy blue dress for a fitting. Maybe I did fit that navy blue dress on Madame Florette the night of the murder. But I didn't kill her. I get it, Inspector Thorne. Mrs. Marsh must have done it to protect her son, Stephen. She must have begged Florette not to expose her son for stealing money from the firm. And when Florette wouldn't listen, Mrs. Marsh stabbed her with those scissors. Mother, mother, you didn't... No, no. I did plead with Madame Florette for my son. And she wouldn't listen. But then... Yes? Someone else came in, Inspector Thorne, and sent me away while I was still fitting her with a navy blue dress. Who came in? Uh, take my advice, Mrs. Marsh. Don't say another word till you get a lawyer. I don't care what happens. I've got to talk, Mr. Harmon. He's the one who came in, Inspector Thorne. George Harmon. Ridiculous. Quiet, Harmon. Go on, Mrs. Marsh. Afterwards, Mr. Harmon came to me and said he'd see that my son Stephen wouldn't be prosecuted for stealing that money... I kept my mouth shut. I thought so. I didn't know it was a case of murder, Inspector Thorne. And when I did find out, I was afraid to talk. The woman's mad. Oh, no, George Harmon. You were much too anxious to open that crate of dresses containing the smuggled diamonds. What's this now, Thorne? You said yourself I was cleared of being in that smuggling racket? But I didn't say you didn't know about it. What? You found out about the diamond smuggling racket the day of the murder, Harmon, and made a beeline to Madame Florette to have it out with her. You were in such a state, you couldn't wait for Mrs. Marsh to finish the fitting of that navy blue dress. That's ridiculous. You argued with Florette. Then you went wild, picked up the scissors, and stabbed her in the back. No! You found out she was going to double-cross you. That she was getting ready to fix things so that if her diamond smuggling racket was exposed, it would look as though you, her secret husband, were the crook. You can prove it. Can't I, Harmon? The Paris police have talked to the French detective you hired when you began to get suspicious of your wife, Florette. All right, Inspector Thorne. You've thought of everything. I'm not sorry I killed Florette. She deserved what she got. I loved her and she only married me for a sucker. She was just trying to find a fall guy. Instead, she found something she didn't bargain for. A murderer. Take him in, Sergeant Muggan. <laughs> And so ends the high-style murder case. The part of Inspector Thorne is played by Carl Weber. Direction by Kenneth McGregor. The script was written by Carol Warner Gluck based on the original story by Frank and Anne Hummert. This is Fred Collins inviting you to tune in again next Friday at the same time when the National Broadcasting Company will present Inspector Thorne in... The Master Mind Murder Case. Stay tuned for Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, next on NBC.
Hi, this is Andrew from otrwesterns.com. I wanted to invite you to come take a look at our site where we put out podcasts of old-time radio westerns. Check us out at otrwesterns.com. You're listening to The Great Detectives of Old-Time Radio with Adam Graham. Now let's get back into the show. Welcome back. Well, the murder victim's excuse for wanting to keep her marriage a secret was not all that credible. In fact, given that uh, her name is uh, Madame, you would expect her to be married, widowed, or divorced. Not single. Though perhaps uh, there may be some other aspect of the French language I'm not getting on this. I'm no expert in French by any means. But that's just kind of basic knowledge. At any rate, uh, we do turn to uh, listener comments and feedback. Uh, Tim writes in, Well, Adam, the yelling of lines has eased some, and the dialogue is improving a bit. I think I may be, may be able to make it through Inspector Thorne after all. Well, I'm glad to hear that, Tim. All right, well, that will do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for Richard Diamond. Next Tuesday, it'll be another episode of Inspector Thorne. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook.